The ACI 318 building code requirements for structural concrete will be fully reorganized in 2014. Ask yourself, have you ever had a difficult time using ACI 318? Have you ever looked for a particular provision but could not find it? Well today I want to talk about the reorganization and the efforts that they made to make the code easier to use by a reorganization, by improving its style, and making it more intuitive to use for the designer. So the next is an overview of the presentation. We'll get into a brief history of ACI 318, who and what we are. We'll get into the rationale for the reorganization and what that reorganization looks like. We'll get into some style issues, some things that makes the code easier to use, and resources that will be available to you and when everything will be coming. So let's get into the brief history. First of all, um, ACI was not ACI. It was not the American Concrete Institute. It was the National Association of Cement Users. And they first got together at the World's Fair 1904, um, quite a long time ago. This is about one year after the Wright brothers flew their airplane, and about four years before the Model T Ford came. We are now the American Concrete Institute, and we're based in Farmington Hills in Michigan. 318 is recognized around the world. Uh, 318.14, which is our flagship document, our code for reinforced concrete, is now the basis for around 20 different countries for their codes for reinforced concrete and is used additionally in, in many other countries as a comparison to the codes that they use. It was first organized by behavior back in 1910, that's National Association of Cement Users. They got together and they made about a 14-page code. And you'll find that even way back then, that 14-page code, that many of those provisions that were made back there are still in the code today with the exact same language. As it moved on from, on from a 14-page code uh, made up to 1956, is probably the end of that first type of code and it was done with a working stress limit. And at that point, we started to get into an ultimate strength approach. And there was a transition from there, and it wasn't until 1971 that we fully went over to an ultimate strength approach. So at that point, we started with 14 pages back in 1910, and now we're up to about 78 pages, which is now 1971. That 78 pages, about 750 provisions. It might sound like a lot, but it's not too bad. As we move forward into 2011, we're at now at 2,500 provisions plus. That's 503 pages. So we've gone through from a working stress to an ultimate strength design, and we've added some information. We're now up to 503 pages. It's quite a code. I'd like to show you the committee that has put that together over all these years. This is the current committee of ACI 318 that is working. Right here we have Randy Poston. He's the current ACI 318 chair. This is a typical meeting that we would have this is the main committee. We also have a, a series of subcommittees. But just to kind of show you who makes up 318, there are people like you and me. They're structural engineers, building code officials. We've got a materials engineer, contractors, and university researchers. So this group of people get together and they give some breadth to the code so that everyone who is, is part of the design process has got a say into the making of this code. Well, now I want to get on to the rationale for the reorganization. Why do we want to do this? And to do that, we got to first understand what we had back in 1971. So remember, keep in mind, 78-page code, around 750 provisions. 1971 code was based around these chapters, chapters 7 through 12. So I said 78 pages. Well, about, this is about 30 pages. So around 30 pages is what we're talking about in the code. Now let's go to a typical example here where we have a column meeting a slab and the detailing of that column. Well, if we read the 30 pages, we have that all in our mind. And as we come to think of a situation that we need to apply it to, like in this case, we can say, OK, I understand for my design I need things out of chapters 9, 10, and 11. And then when I get to my detailing, well, that's in chapter 7 and 12. Now there's reasons for why they're there. but you know. 30 pages, I think I can do this. I can apply the code to my different situations. And then you have some oddball ones here 
where you see like ties and joints, 11, 10, 2. Well, that's a, that's a shear chapter, so that's behavior, but it has a detailing requirement in it. So it starts to see where it's a little complicated. Detailing is just not in chapter 7 and 12. It's also buried in amongst the design information. Well, that's 1971. We move along. We find people want to add things to the code. So what we see is, although all these things you see here are covered in 1971, they wanted to say more about these particular topics. So now we have a little bit more about two-way slabs. Enough got together. They said, okay, let's make a chapter about this. Now they didn't pull everything out of seven out of seven through twelve. They might have pulled out a few things to make these chapters, but the intent was oh, I just read, if I have a two-way slab, I still have to keep chapters 7 through 12 in mind, and then I have to read chapter 13 and understand how it interacts with that. Now let's think back to that detail one more time. Let's say that, that slab or precast. Well, now I have to read the precast chapter. I have to understand everything in it, and I have to think about how it is applied back to chapter 7 and 12. Now let's make those columns pre-stressed precast. Now I have to understand chapter 18, which might affect chapter 16. So you can see that we're starting to get more and more difficulty in trying to understand what, where things are in this code. Not only do we have new chapters, we have new ideas that were placed in here. So let's kind of concentrate on, say, the fourth one down called integrity reinforcement. And integrity reinforcement, we put that mostly in chapter 7. Why? Because it's extra bars. So that, remember, that's a detailing chapter, chapter 7 but I also have some special detailing for two-way slabs. That's a chapter. I have some special detailing for precast, so I gotta put some stuff there. Well, now I gotta tell you that these things are in all these different places. We are now to 2,000 cross-references in our code. Remember back on the previous slides, we only have 2,500 requirements in 3.18.11. We have 2,000 cross-references. So I think we're starting to understand the problem that we have. Now this little picture is here for fun. It might be even a little bit over the top, but I think we can all understand it. You start off with a garage, it looked like it was fairly well organized to begin with, right? You got a bench in there, you got a pegboards in the back. Clearly they had some plans for this garage. But over time, things didn't quite fit, things got overgrown, misplaced, thrown on the floor. This is your garage, you're doing great. You understand where everything is. If your neighbor needed to come in and you say something like a hammer, how are they ever gonna find it? They just can't use it. The committee began to understand this. They started to get these kind of comments. So they started to have some discussions, say back in 2003. What kind of problem do we have? And they started to understand that the problem they had is the organization that they have. They wanted to confirm that. They asked, they had put out some surveys, they had some workshops, trying to get, you know, how does the current state of practice like using ACI 318 and can we make it better? By about 2007, all that effort came down to, yes, we have a problem. I think we think the answer is what's something called as a member-based design. And so in 2008, the committee decided that they'll move forward. The goals of the committee was that they wanted to find information quickly. Once again, ease of use. This is something that came, kind of came up a lot in the surveys, is the certainty that a design fully meets the code. What does that mean? Once again, I'll, I'll keep trying to go back to your memory on that joint detail where I pointed out the detailing requirement for shear it was, an 11, it was a chapter 11 requirement. It wasn't in a detailing chapter, 7 or 12. I had to put in extra bar due to a design requirement. But where is that? I mean, I go to my detailing chapters, I can't find things. I, I know that requirement exists. Oh, it was related to shear. Oh, it was related to torsion. Oh, it was related to structural integrity. Oh, it just was difficult. So what we want to do is we want to reorganize this in such a way that I don't have to go, oh that I understand that I have met the code. So what we need to do is clean that garage. So we've taken everything out. The committee's been working hard at this. They have gone through eight ballots a year for almost six years with several hundred page ballots each time. It has been a tremendous amount of work for them. The committee accomplished that they are now going to a member-based design, which is designed from the perspective of the designer. And now they have this nice new clean garage in which you can find anything easily. You'll be able to find that hammer. You'll be able to find that saw. And it's organized in such a manner that we're able to put new things in, like this shiny new car. 
So I think we've identified the problem. I think we have our goals clearly in mind. The committee's been working. We want to get into how 318.14 is actually organized. What is this thing going to look like? So here's everything boxed up. We also said at the very beginning of the presentation, it's not just ease of use, but we want to make this intuitive to use. So what the committee decided upon was that they would approach the code layout as an engineer designs their building. This would make then the code intuitive. So what they hope to do is, as an engineer approaches any project, they first say, talk to a code official, get the rules of the road, they choose a structure they're going to design, they do an analysis, they didn't design the different pieces and parts, and then they communicate this information on into a set of contract documents. This is how the new code is laid out. I'm going to show the reorganization um, is basically into six different categories. We'll, I'll just go over this briefly. This is a general section, a structural systems section, a members. So once you got done with your, your system that you chose, you design your members. You put those members together in joints and connections. Toolbox is kind of a unique thing. There's a lot of provisions that are get used over and over again. So just like a tool that you might need to help finish your design or your analysis, you come and get your tool and you go back and you finish your work. And then we have a construction chapter which is related to the contract documents, which is at the end of the job. So let's go through each one of these in more detail. First one is the general section, general chapters. Our code, ACI 318, is the reinforced concrete structural code. It is adopted by a model code. Uh, in particular, one today is the International Building Code done by ICC. We have to understand that there is a hierarchy of codes, and that the, these codes are then all assembled because they're steel codes, there's uh, plumbing codes, electrical codes, and they all come together and they eventually get adopted by a state or a local jurisdiction. This front section is really just helping you get set with the rest of the world as far as the scope, the applicability, interpretations. Of course, we have notation, all the, the normal stuff. We have, I put concrete design and steel design in here as well. If you remember in old chapter three, we had, had a material section that had all the ASTMs that we use, but there was also a lot of limits on, this, on different steels and concretes for different situations that was sprinkled throughout the code. So we brought all that information in. We brought into that old chapter three, and at some point it was decided that this is actually two chapters. So this is kind of a general reference chapter. Systems. Systems is, I'm going to call it new. We're all going to have a new chapter. We never had one before called structural systems. And so once you've based yourself what jurisdiction you're in, what code you're under, you then have to then choose your structural system. Well, ACI 318 never really directly talked about a structural system. When you got into the seismic chapter, it might have just discussed a certain type of structural system related to seismic and ASCE 7, but we just didn't really talk about it. Now we are straightforward. The first thing you do as a structural engineer is you choose a structural system. This chapter will address those structural systems and then how you go about using the rest of the code. And uh, once you choose your structural system, you put on your loads, load combinations. Of course, we rely heavily on ASCE 7. We will continue to do so. Uh, you get into your structural analysis. ACI 3.10 has many sections that allow you to do permissible analysis that make your life easier. Now, with a lot of the con computer methods that we have today, you know, you don't need to use often, but they're still in there. We went ahead and said earthquake resistant structures, and we put this in this location as well, because they will talk about structural systems as well. Now, uh, seismic systems are largely concerned with ductility, and therefore you have a lot of additional detailing, and it's appropriate that we talk about it at this location. So once we have our structural systems, we put on our loads, we run our analysis to design our members. So these are the member chapters. You'll notice a couple of them are already in there, walls, foundations. Now we just kind of filled out the rest of them, slabs, beams, columns. We added one called diaphragms. Now that's part of slabs as well, but there's enough unique information. We wanted to give it its own chapter. Now the neat thing about the member chapters is that they're all organized the exact same way. So whether or not you're in a beam or a column, in this case, we just chose chapter 10 here, just as a random chapter to show you. But we have seven sections within them. They're all labeled the same. 
you will find like information in each section. So let's go over those information in each section. So let's go over those a little bit. First of all, we'll have a scope. Seems simple, but we have a lot of chapters right now in 318 don't tell you really the scope of what it is you're starting to read. It's, it's simple stuff, just a couple provisions, but gets you based what you're looking at. General, this kind of gets back to some general limitations. How a member might react with the structural system that we were talking about earlier. So once again, these first several sections as I talk about them, they're kind of relating you back to the structural analysis part you did, the systems part. So there's a tie-in, there's a tie together. 10.3, design limits. These are simple things like the uh, size of the member. So before you even get started in your design, you might want to know if there's some limitations that the code is placing upon you. Once again, that's only just a couple of requirements typically in any one chapter. Required strength is nothing more than what comes out of your analysis. But we do have limits, or let's say not just limits, but we also say where along that member we actually look at a section to do our design. It's not necessarily always where it's at its highest. It might be at a distance, say, d over 2 from the face of the column, for those of you who like to design. So that kind of information would be here. These first four sections aren't very much. They might fit on a page, page and a half. They tie you back into the rest of the code. But once you've got set, once you've got what it is you need to design to, we move on to design. Design strength is where we get into the actual design of the member. The first four sections, as we just discussed, that brought you back to the rest of the code. Now we're going to get into the design of the actual column. Here we have the minimum size of the member and the minimum amount of steel necessary to meet the required strength. Once you've determined that, there's always a reinforcement limit. It was surprising how many limits there were on reinforcement, enough that we thought we needed a section just for that. And each member type, we actually had quite a few provisions that were in 10.6 here. So, in, And then detailing. I talked about 2,500 provisions in the code in 318.11. Half of those requirements are detailing requirements. Half. So it's no surprise when you get into these chapters that half of these chapters our reinforcement detailing. And then they are laid out in a similar fashion, although we're just going to the first layer here, sections one through seven of any uh, member chapter. When you get into 10.7, then there is another flow that starts to show as well. But we're not gonna get into that today, but you'll notice that at each member chapter, you'll start to identify and find places in similar locations for ease of use. So let's go back to what it looked like to design in 71. We had chapter 7 through chapter 12. 318's come in. They've done a little bit of their magic here. And today, you'll find that it's all within one chapter. What they've done is they made a roadmap for you. So remember that one point where we're trying to say, how do I know when I'm done? Well, you'll now know you're done. You'll, all you have to do is go into this chapter and follow it from beginning to end, and it will hit every point you need to hit. There is no guesswork. When you reach the bottom of the chapter, you have completed the design for a column. Okay, we're going to move on to joints and connections. We've, we've run our analysis. We got our required strengths. We've designed our members. Now we need to start putting this thing together. So we have what we call joints and connections. Uh, we'll have parts that are beam column, slab column joints. So this is cast in place construction. Then we'll have another chapter, which is what precast, connections between members. We talked about that before where we had a precast chapter, but that also got into design. We've pulled that apart a little bit. So what is applicable to, to the actual beam design or column design is in its location. And if we wanted to connect the two in a certain way, that is now in its own chapter. We have one last type of joint or connection that's called anchors to concrete. Old Appendix D, which is now a chapter in 318.14. Appendix D is now a regular chapter, but this we attach something else to concrete. It's not concrete to concrete. It is, uh, you know, anytime I take a bolt or a cast in anchor or a post installed anchor, I want to attach something to a cast in place piece of concrete. That's what anchorage to concrete is. The toolbox chapter. Now before I said we had this thing called a road map, where all you had to do was follow the chapter from the beginning to the end and you're done. 
But a lot of times there was repetitive items, things like development length calculations. Well, that, that's done throughout the code. So we didn't want to keep telling you how to do development length, so that was what we called a tool. That's just a tool, that's a hammer. So we put it down in these toolbox chapters, and the idea here is, is not that you read these chapters from beginning to end. That's not the idea at all. We want you to use those roadmaps, and if the roadmap tells you to go somewhere, you go to that location, follow the instructions at location, and come back. Do not continue to read the rest of the chapter. It's a toolbox. Kind of to illustrate this point, here we have just a member chapter, say section 5, where here it says if PU is less than 0.1 F prime CAG, you guys all know this stuff, it should be calculated in quarts with 22.3. Well, the calculation of MN is really only about four or five requirements, and we do it over and over again for all our flexural members in design. So we put those design requirements in one section 22.3. So the idea is you go to 22.3, when you're done, you go back, and, you're, and you keep on going down the list. So then the very next one, he says go to 22.4. It is a little bit of jumping around. You could say it's a cross-reference, but not really. It is meant more as to be as more of a road map and not a cross-reference. And construction. One thing that came out of the redesign is we had a lot of construction requirements. Think back to the 1910 code I talked about, 14 pages. It was a lot of rules of thumb. Well, they didn't have a lot of science yet at that time, but they'd been building a lot of structures and they had a lot to say that, you know, if I do X, X seems like, you know, if I do Y, things will be okay. So they had what we call those things rules of thumb. Well, those rules of thumb are still in 318.11 today and they wreak some sort of havoc really on the code because it's not really how we write code anymore. We write code for law, not as rules of thumb. And a lot of these things were just general of a design requirement and then say, well, by the way, you need to roughen the surface of the concrete for whatever reason. It's a kind of a contracting requirement. I mean, it's a, it's a surface prep, it's a direction to the contractor, but it's not really a code requirement. And these things are littered through the code. And so we've collected all those items and we've brought them to chapter 26. And in doing so, I said, well, what are we trying to do? Do we want the contractor to read 318 and try to understand it? 318 is directed to the licensed design professional. They are required to design to law. That is the licensed design professional's purpose. The contractor needs to follow the contract documents. They're in a contract between the owner and themselves. And we need to help the owner write a set of contract documents that help them follow law. But we don't really want the contractor in there interpreting law. So now that we brought everything here, those words were massaged a little bit so that they're written to the engineer saying this is the information you need to put in the contract documents. Let me show a little language example here. Just a couple things here. If we look down at say 6.4.3, construction joints shall be made so located not to impair the strength of the structure. Well that's, that's direction to the engineer. Um, but should the contractor go in and read that and say, well, am I liable in this case? What, what's going on here? Who am I talking to in this existing code? And that's language that you'll find all the way back to 1910. All that language you just read has been reorganized now as direction to a licensed design professional. So it doesn't read the same clearly. It's now more direction to what goes on the contract documents. We're also going to talk a little bit about style. We've talked about reorganization, ease of use. Along that same line, you can do reorganization for ease of use, but you can also do it in style. So if we read this provision from 318.11, 761, this is fairly simple. All we're trying to give is a limit on spacing of pre-stressing strand. And we have a bunch of conditions that would change depending on strength of concrete and size of the wire. But you read this and you have to read it several times and perhaps you start even sketching something down on your own notepad just trying to understand what it is it's trying to communicate to you. So we've been bringing tables in, ways to present the information in a clear fashion. So now all we're really looking for is a minimum spacing so we can clearly see what the minimum spacing requirement is for the conditions as we lead, read from left to right. The guesswork is gone. You don't have to make tables on the side. You don't have to add extra little notes. The information is now clearly communicated just by doing a, a different sense of style. 
Another way, and this is really goes to the reorganization, is remember where I was talking about we added these extra chapters to the 71 code. Well, one was pre-stressing, it's chapter 18. And we talked about all those cross-references that you have to do now. Here's 3.18.11 as it exists today. You open up chapter 18, and by the third provision, you are faced with this. The following provision of this code shall not apply to pre-stressed concrete, except as specifically noted in these locations. Now, this is quite a burden on the structural engineer to figure out, to mention the building code official who's trying to interpret it and to determine whether or not you met the conditions of law. For our style, we come to this slide. Instead of having to figure out which sections do and do not apply, we are explicit. So if we go to say 9.6, now remember that was reinforcement limits. Now we have pre-stressed and non-pre-stressed, but all the requirements are as follows. So under 9.6.1, all the minimum flexural reinforcement and non-pre-stressed beams, all those requirements are there. In the very next section, it says if you are a pre-stressed beam, these are your requirements. You don't have to figure things out. The new titles and the organization lay it out clearly to you when things apply and don't apply without saying except for this, except for that. And 9.7 is a similar example where we talk about non-pre-stressed beams first, then pre-stressed beams. Same thing with columns, with walls, so on and so on. So as a summary, what we've shown today, what 318-14 committee has accomplished, is they have reorganized the code from the designer's perspective. That is, they've made it intuitive by following the design process they follow to design a building. They've made it easier to find the different requirements, and they've reduced the cross-references greatly. Uh, some additional benefits, uh, the tables are outstanding. We have so many more tables in the code. Should have been there a long time ago, and they just they make things so much easier to understand. We'll have consistent language. We have an editorial group that'll get together, and we'll try to use the same type of words in the same locations. A lot of times when you have a, when you have a committee, uh, different groups of people speak in different ways and the code starts to sound garbled at some point. So we will go back through and try to clean up the language a little bit. And the last thing that was done was a conscious effort to make one thought per provision. There's a lot of times people have whole thoughts, an idea, and you, you, you get to write prose and you start to write a paragraph and then two paragraphs. But what you've done is these people are trying to, we're trying to write law. And law has to be staccato with separate thoughts. So we understand what the intent of the requirement is, one thought, one idea, one requirement. And so that, that has been done throughout the code. Now we've gone through why we need to do it, what we did, and the different style issues. Let's go ahead and talk about what's coming up next. So one reason why we're having this presentation about a year before the code even comes out is to help you understand what the reorganization is so that you can help us. What we have is a public comment period coming up here early next year. What is a public comment period? Well, every standard in the United States, if it is a sta standard, must go through a public review. You have a chance to make a difference to the code. You'll have, we'll have the entire code for your review. Now that you've seen this presentation, you'll understand why it is organized the way it is. And hopefully you can give some insightful comments, review it thoroughly, and let us know what you think about the code. We should finish up here probably mm, next two, three months. We have what's called an internal review at TAC. It's a quality control group. And then public comment will come out hopefully about May, June and the committee then will respond to comments. And those will be, you'll be responded to publicly. And then we'll have publication by December of 2014. 318.14, as in 318.11, will be provided in English, Spanish, US customary units, SI units, every combination of those you can think of. Um, we're working on other languages as well. Uh, we're also moving into the 21st century where we're trying to have everything in PDF, EPUB, MOBI. If you think about it, if it's widely used, we will try to have it, not just 318, but all of ACI documents. Within the next year, 
we'll have everything available on all those platforms. And to help you, the engineer, as you make this transition, and to help you, the engineer, as you make this transition, this whole time I've been using the word reorganization, and I really mean it. It's only a reorganization of the existing information. If you designed a building from the 11 and the 14, you should get the same design. So we're not trying to give you anything new here. So what we've made are some transition maps. And what you can do is if you go, I know that code requirement. It's in 318.11. I can show it to you right here. Where is it in 14? You'll be able to get to it. And same thing with 14. You swear that requirement never existed before. Well, you can go in here and show where, and it shows you where it came from. Now, our concrete design manual, what we call the SP-17, we've had that for decades, 60, 70 years. It'll be fully up to date with 318.14, showing how to use the new 318.14 as a member design basis with examples. We are an example-driven manual. It's not quite like, say, a PCA notes, where it gives you the requirement and then kind of shows a picture or maybe a part of an example of it. This is a full-blown examples over and over again. It's extensive. It should be a lot of help. Of course, we'll continue to have online learning, in-person seminars, so don't worry, all that stuff is still coming. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you for viewing this today. If you have any questions, please contact the website, and we will be happy to get back to you.